and we'll talk about it a little bit, but the bottom line is that's where you get to live. If you're saved, when the trumpet sounds, we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. There's the trouble on earth, and we come back with Jesus and the, during the millennial reign of Christ. So, Don, can you go back or somebody go back to the graph we had before? During this thousand-year millennium, a mill a thousand, during that kingdom age, you go back to the one we just saw. Now go to the next one. We're living there. I have no idea if that's what it's going to look like. Um, the more I study, the less I think it's going to be a cube. But it doesn't matter. So it does say it's coming down from God as a bride adorned for her husband. Go to the next picture. All right. Um, it's probably more pyramidic shaped. Um, the walls are only 120 feet high. And so we got 120 foot walls and we've got this maybe pyramid type shape. 1600 mile by 1600 mile by a gazillion mile high golden city no need for light there because jesus is the light and i'm just quoting scripture be patient because you would not want me to have you turned all the scripture all right so hold that picture we just now read a moment ago the end of verse one of micah chapter four the end of verse one it says and people shall flow into it verse two and many nations shall come verse three and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations. God will be dealing with nations on the planet Earth. You and I will be in heaven. We'll be, and see, what we call heaven is really a city. Right now, today, there's the heaven, meaning the air, the atmosphere. Then there's the heaven where the stars and the planets are. And then there's that place God lives. And so there's, when you read in the scripture, the word heavens used different places. But what most of us think about heaven, when, you know, our friend or loved one went, uh, died and went to heaven, we're thinking New Jerusalem, and, and no one's in the New Jerusalem yet, all right? It's still, the, they haven't finished, they're still doing construction, right? Because when you get saved, they build a mansion for you, for you. So uh, it's still where you're in the place, you're in the heaven that God's in, and he says, hang on. You won't believe the city I've got for you. It's just not done yet, all right? So look over to Zechariah chapter 8. If you're in my, uh, whatever book you're in, Micah, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Just keep going. You'll find Zechariah. If you get to Matthew, you went too far. These are called the minor prophets, and it has to do with how much people read them. Really, they're called minor because they're shorter. And I'd, I'd say, who knows how they titled major pro prophets because Isaiah is 66 books long or chapters long and Ezekiel is eternal. And you try reading Ezekiel, it never ends. But uh, Zechariah, look at chapter 8 of Zechariah. And uh, um, flip over to one more picture, Don, the next one after this. Look at there. You know what that is? God sent me this picture. That's the people going up to the New Jerusalem. There they are. Let's hope well, you're, you're one of those people. But there's going to be massive amounts of people going toward or entering into that city. Now, I'm going to try and put some things in place. You that are Christians, been reading your Bible for years, hopefully you'll learn some things. If you're a newer Christian and this is all going right over your head, come back tonight. It'll be easier um, if you ever listen to last week's message. Um, but I, th I think this is going to be fine for all of you. I'm going to give you three different passages to look at, and then it'll be very, very practical. All right, look at Zechariah 8. We'll look at this picture again in a minute. Zechariah 8.20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall, it shall yet come to pass that uh, there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily. To pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. You see, there's a day coming when literal cities are going to flow to a place somewhere where they can seek God. Whole cities of people are going to go and they're going to go learn from God. Where we read back there in Micah, God is going to teach them. They're going to go there to learn the word of God, and God is going to teach them, and they are going to gather together to learn the word of God. Has anybody heard of that happening anywhere yet? No, it's a future thing. It's going to happen. This is Right now, we are where we started in that first picture. Go back to our very first, the graph there, Mr. House. There we go. We're here in this church age. Um, 
Jesus is up in heaven. He's going to one day come and set up this thousand-year reign and then an eternal reign uh, with a new heaven, new earth, everything new. Death and hell will be cast into a lake of fire, all of it gone. And God wipes away the tears from our eyes here, and then he wipes away the tears from our eyes again back here. And there's a reason, because there's some pretty sad things going to happen in eternity, and one of them is a whole bunch of people going to hell. And uh, here in Isaiah 66 talks about we'll be able to look into hell, a literal place, a literal place of fire where their worm dieth not, and it'll, it'll make believers out of you. You know, anybody who's a non-believer, wait, wait till this day. By the way, if you wait till that day to believe, we'll be looking at you. You don't want to end up there, all right? And Jesus is the answer, not me, not the Baptist church. Jesus is the answer. But this kingdom age, so we're back here. There's a day coming the believers will be caught away. There's a day coming when we'll come back with Jesus and we'll reign uh, with him for a thousand years and on and on from there. Now, look back with me. We're in Zechariah. So we've got a time coming. I'm sorry. This time here during this kingdom age, people are going to come from all over the world to that place where Jesus lives. Now, two things are going to happen. Number one, Jesus is going to reign on a physical throne in a physical place called Jerusalem. The real place right over there in Israel, right, I believe, at the Temple Mount is today. He's going to go, and that Dome of the Rock and all the other Muslim nonsense is going to be blown away. He'll set up his, by the way, during the tribulation time right in here, uh, that there is going to be a Jewish throne set up, Jewish worship set up. Then the Antichrist is going to sit on that. They call it the abomination of desolation in Matthew and in the book of, of Daniel. And then the Antichrist will set himself up as God. And then Jesus comes back and says, really, you want to arm wrestle? And, uh, and, <laughs> and who made your arm? But anyway, uh, he comes back, boots the whole bunch down into a lake of fire. A thousand year we're on earth, reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ. But there are people who are going to go into that eternal kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, and people who go into the eternal kingdom. All right, go back to Isaiah chapter 2. These are all verses you never hear anybody teach or preach on. And, um, and, and not that not nobody, but it's just not, I know these are not familiar verses. Isaiah, middle of your Bible, Psalms start going past Psalm toward, the, toward where we were, and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel are big books. Isaiah chapter 2. Now, while we're doing this, if you are thinking of questions, there's too many people to do Q&A in here, but you want to talk about it, write your question down so you won't forget. Call me, text me, email me, come by and see me. I'd love to sit and talk. This stuff's way better than marriage counseling <laughs> because, this, because this is for sure. Marriage counseling is always a little maybe, maybe not. But uh, look at Isaiah chapter 2. You there with me? Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, verse 2, Isaiah 2, 2, and it shall come to pass in the, what is it? There you got those last days again. In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, wait, remember we read earlier about the mountain of the Lord's house. That, that place God puts that new Jerusalem is going to be up on top of a mountain somewhere. And, uh, and the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now don't lose your place. That's exactly what we read in, in uh, Zechariah and in Micah. Now these guys, um, we've got Isaiah is about 722 B.C., Zechariah is 500 B.C., Micah is about 700 B.C. So these are all hundreds of years before our Lord's birth. That's why the miracle of, of some of the prophecies about Jesus' birth coming into these things are. But it's all the same thing as we read in Isaiah and Micah. Now look at chapter 2. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, chapter 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations. We read about that already in Micah and Zechariah. And shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their pruning hooks and on and on. Now, uh, if you go down to Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66, just flip over a couple pages. We've got the Lord coming, setting up an earthly throne on a city in Jerusalem. He's also got a heavenly throne in a city where you and I live. We are not going to live 
how are we going to reign and rule with Christ if we're the ones on earth? We're going to be up in this heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and we're reigning and ruling. Remember the parable where Jesus said to the guy, he gave this one uh, two talents, this one five, this one ten, and the guy took his ten and he made ten more, and Jesus, the, the master said, well done, be thou ruler over ten cities, right? So your faithfulness in serving God today will determine your position of leadership in that millennial thousand year reign. And what we get this, you watch Casper and Donald Duck too much. We think, you know, when you die, you float away with a harp and a halo and some wings and you sit in a cloud. What kind of life is that? I mean, after about two days, what do you do now? You know, you're going to start playing bumper clouds and Let's be real. The God who made the universe has got plans, folks. He is not done. This mess we're in on earth caused by man because we rebelled against God from Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit, from every kind of criminal and vile and disgusting thing mankind can invent, all that garbage. God is redeeming a people for himself by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you're born into that heavenly family you are called the bride of Christ and when the trumpet sounds you're caught away to be with Jesus in the air he is going to whoop the fire out of everything that went wrong on earth and he's going to set up a new heaven and a new earth you're not going to get whooped because your sins got whooped on Calvary that makes sense why will I not be punished for my sins double jeopardy Jesus already did suffer for my sins and when you put your, look, you're going to hurt for your sins or Jesus will hurt for your sins. It's your choice. And I chose Christ in 1975. And it's totally up to you. And God is not going to compel you. He's not going to force you. Uh, we'll, we'll encourage you to trust Christ. But what you do from then on will determine where you are here during this kingdom age when you're reigning and ruling with Christ. And... You know, you can be unemployed, living on welfare. I don't know. Maybe you'll be sweeping the golden streets. I have no idea. But I do know this. There are rewards Jesus talks about over and over. You read the parables in Matthew. Those are kingdom parables. They're all about this kingdom age. The other gospels don't have those parables because Matthew was primarily written to convince the Jewish people about their coming king the Messiah who would reign and set up an earthly throne and a heavenly throne. So we're in this heavenly city. Skip over four pictures there, Mr. House. One, two, three. There we go. That's where you are. And that's the road. God sent me this picture via the Internet. And um, we're up there reigning and ruling with Christ. Now, there's no mountain here. But you know what? There are not many artists that know their Bible. It's a problem. If any of you are artistic... Laylene, get out of school, come join me, and we'll write Christian children's books and, ch and Christian artwork and do, do doctrinal studies by Chalk Talk. Uh, I know a guy who does that, but you can't use his name because everybody thinks you're a heathen. But uh, <laughs> there's this new Jerusalem, and there's a road. There's the golden streets. We're going to be in a place, and, and when the rainbow is going to be redeemed from the perverts. Amen. Come on to the men's conference. You men, ask your wife if it's okay you be a man that one Friday, Saturday, okay? <laughs> we'll send him home trained to say, yes, ma'am, ladies. Don't worry about it. And uh, there's that new city. Th th heaven is a place with people, a real place. John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. There's not going to be any crutches up there. No wheelchairs, no prosthetics, no patches on our eyes, no hearing aids, no gout, no arthritis. And it's going to be a wonderful day. No walkers, no golf courses. You say, why? Because they cause people to sin. <laughs> they cause people to, no bars, no golf course, cause you to lie and cheat and cuss. <laughs> uh, you got this place and... The rainbow is about the throne of God, and it's, man, it's an incredible place. We read there in Revelation chapter 4, but we don't have time. So I don't know where I had you turn last, but in Isaiah 66, 18, it does say this. 
Chapter 66, verse 18, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Amen. And there's a day coming when he'll get the glory he deserves. Now the lost, they're going to bow at the judgment, the great white throne judgment seat, and they will call Jesus Lord. They'll fall on their faces and worship him as he throws them into hell. But there's a whole bunch of people that have never been able to give God the glory he deserves. And there are nations, and that has to do with how they treat the Jewish people during the tribulation. Another story I'm not going to get into, but there are nations that will be there in that, in that world on earth while we're in this heavenly city. And they'll give God the glory he deserves. He's been mocked enough. This B.C.E. nonsense. Before this common era. Anytime I see that in a book, I, I scribble it out. B.C. before Christ and A.D. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. See, the, the atheists hate that Jesus created our calendar. They hate that literally the world's dating system is all focused on Bethlehem. The world hates it. And they can't stand that Jesus, this little baby, this man that never traveled more than about 50 miles from his birthplace, that the world revolves around that name that's above every name. And the devil hates that. And this godless world hates it. And everybody in the swamp in D.C. hates it. That's why, by the way, you shouldn't have your kids in a public school. Will you let a bunch of swamp dwellers teach your children? I'll just tell you, you need your kids in a private school. You need your kids in a school where the book is welcomed and the teachers know Christ. Now, however you do, it's up to you. We've got a school, very limited enrollment. We'd love to have more kids in it if money was available. But, but we want kids in our school who want to live for God. You know, don't go to our school on Monday and and uh, go to the movies and parties and dances on Friday. That, that doesn't work with our school. We want a seven-day-a-week Christianity in our school. And, and still, we have, still we have sinners in there. Can you believe it? And they start with the principal and the teachers. <laughs> We're all a bunch of sinners. But I'll tell you what, put your, get your kids out of that government school that hates God and hates the Bible and hates it. But I'll tell you, one day those nations are going to come to him and worship him and adore him and give him the glory that he deserves. Praise God for the day that's coming. Look with me real quickly. There's too many verses. Some of you know the song in Psalms 89. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee. O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Hey, look over to Revelation. Last book of your Bible. I know for some of you there's more Bible than you've looked at all week long. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. But I've had a long week with my poor foot. I could pout about it, except that some of you know David Applegarth. He got saved here. I led him to Christ 35 years ago, and, and uh, he had his leg amputated right below the knee this week. And um, I'm thinking my foot feels really good. And uh, don't, uh, don't, don't get grumbling. You've got it good. We all have it good. If you're saved, you've got it good. Uh, you, you heard that guy from Australia speak with no arms and no legs? Praising God, giving glory to God, no arms, no legs. Tell me your problem. Man, we are blessed. We are blessed people. Revelation chapter 11. Look there, last book of your Bible. Hey, do you remember Remember, oh, Mark chapter 11 somewhere? You're looking at Revelation 11. Mark, Mark chapter 11. Jesus is teaching the people when they brought all the stuff to sell into the church, into the temple. Remember Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. But you know what we most of us don't realize? The, re the, next, the next phrase, of all nations. Not talking about the house you and I are in. Not talking about that temple there in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He's talking about that one. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. The day's coming, folks. The day's coming when those who are blessed enough to get into that kingdom 
And how they do it, no time to talk about it. There's plenty of verses that talk about it. But I'll tell you what, you're not going to worry about your job now when you're living there. I'll tell you something, be a little more blunt. You're not going to worry about that broken marriage when you're living there. It's, a, it's an ugly world, beats people up. Like the song Natasha sang at Christmas time, the world treat me mean, Lord. Treat you mean too. Not there. It's going to be a good place. In Revelation with me? Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, and I'm not there. Look at Revelation 11, verse 15. Revelation 11, 15, the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know that little phrase people say in sports, uh, I own you? You know, he says, I own you now. I, that, not just that he, he owns it all now. He could turn the world into dust in a moment if he wanted, but he's going to rule. It's his kingdom. Look over to verse 17, Revelation 11, and down at verse 17. Um, verse 17 saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power in this reign. See, God's always been almighty. He has let the arrogance of humanity think they run things. He has let people lie and cheat and steal. He's let people have positions of political leadership and be corrupt. He's let people pretend they're justice, uh, Supreme Court justices when they're not just, and pretend they're judges and law enforcement when they're not judge, nor do they enforce the law, but he's taking control. The day's coming. He's saying, thank God he is one day. Verse 18, and all, and the nations were angry. Ow. We've been reading about nations coming and worshiping. There's some nations, they ain't very happy about all this. Can you go to that first picture, Brother Don, the, the, uh, the graph, whatever you want. There you go. You see, this tribulation time's going on, and they're beginning to realize they're not nearly as tough as they thought they were. In an instant, a third of the people in the world die. Earthquakes, floods, famine, the sun's dark, and, and monsters. You want to talk about zombie apocalypse. Uh, you, your AR will not help. You read through the, the vile judgments and the trumpet judgments here in these where we are in Revelation. And during this time, evil is going to run rampant, more evil, more vile, more destructive. And, and there's a point coming when God, they're going to all know it's God. And they're going to see him. They're going to see him. They're going to see him. And the Jews are going to get saved by the multitudes. And the worlds are going to hate him. And that's what we're reading about right here, Revelation chapter 11. In uh, verse 18, the nations are angry. They don't want God. They don't want to submit to God. And by the way, just so you understand, you're witnessing to someone, you think, what do I say to someone? You can say all you want, but words only get here. Faith is down here. And I think facts are important and logic is important, but at some point they need to take those facts and logic and put faith in into practice because a man believeth unto as who sure John 3 16 who sure believeth in him it's not knowledge it's belief it's faith with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation and that confession isn't to a guy wearing a skirt calling himself father uh, verse 17 and uh, that thou shouldest give look, let's read all of verse 18 Revelation 11 18 and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged. There they go. They're coming right up out of the grave, man. And, and there's no new bodies promised. Think on that one. You know all these movies? You, know, you take Greek mythology and all the Hollywood scary movies. They're, they're just little flickers of what the devil knows is really going to happen. To you and I, dead believers over in the Wildemar Cemetery, the trumpet sounds, they instantly get a new body. They come right out of the ground. Perfect, glorified body can eat all day and night and never get full. That is awesome. <laughs> can bury your face in a chocolate fountain and just drink. And it's just going to be good. But the dead lost have no promise of a new body. That body in that cemetery, that's how they're coming out of there. 
soul, body. I don't know how it's going to work. I know it's going to be way worse than zombie movies. The time of the dead, verse 18, that they should be judged, and thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should and shouldst destroy them, which destroy the earth. In verse 19, and the temple of God was open in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament right there with whoever that guy was that was looking for it. I forget his name. You know who searched for Indiana Jones. That's it. That's who it is. He's right there. He found the real one. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. And it goes on and on. This is unbelievable. Go over to chapter 15 uh, just for the sake of time. Hey, don't doubt this. The socialists, the communists, the atheists, they don't want God. They don't want God here. If Jesus walked into Washington Square right now with nail-pierced hands and offered himself, most of the people in D.C. would throw him out if they could. They want nothing to do with God. They want to be God, just like Isaiah 14. They want to exalt their thrones above everything. Look at Revelation 15, just a couple pages over. Revelation 15 and verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Well, there's a bunch of idiots back in chapter 11 that didn't. But see, by now he's burned them all up. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. You know why? Because all the other ones burned up. Uh, for thy judgments are made manifest. One more. Look over to chapter 21. Oh, see, God is interested in nations, and God is interested in people, and God's interested in you. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. He loves you. But God, God's after, he wants the worship of nations. Now that silly Olympics going on in Japan. You wait and see the gathering throngs when Jesus shows up. And see people of every race and every country and every era in history coming up to that new Jerusalem to worship and give him the praise that he deserves. Revelation 21 and verse 24. Revelation 21 verse 24. And the nations of them which are what? Hmm, how about that? The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the, end, and the gates of it, verse 25, the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. In verse 26, they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now, the whole world, this is the new world. All the glory, all the good, all, from all over the world, people are going to, like the word pilgrimage, they're going to be coming to that new Jerusalem just to bring the very best of the best to worship Jesus Christ. Now, does it going to matter where you live today as long as you live there? Does it matter whether you're in an apartment and had to hitch a ride to church or whether you're in a 5,000 square foot house, you got four cars. Is that going to matter at all when you're in that place? Let me give you four quick things. Number one, this world will pass away. First Peter says, Second Peter chapter 3 says that seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. Second Peter 3, 11 and 12. What manner of persons ought we to be? Number one, this world's going to pass away. Number two, don't allow the things of this world to dominate your thinking. It's all going to be gone. Now, if you hurt right now, it's hard to not have your hurt on the back, in the back of your mind. But try to keep your mind. Come back tonight, and I'm going to talk about this. Uh, when things are broken, what do you do? But, but, but understand this. This world's only temporary. It doesn't matter. Don't, don't let the things of this world control and dominate what, what motivates you. Number three, loss down here does not indicate loss up there because Jesus was crucified the apostles lost their lives. New Testament believers had all their possessions taken away from them. The apostle Paul said, I know how to abound and abase. Paul said, I know how to be broke. It's okay to be broke. Because I'm going to that golden city, it doesn't matter. 
So I said, number one, the things this world will pass away. Number two, don't let the things this world dominate you. Number three, don't let loss down here discourage you because loss here may mean gain up there. Number four, concern yourself with the eternal. You got to work. You got to pay bills. Do the best you can. But you know what? What really matters is the eternal. You got two, three, four children, many of you. I tell you, from the moment my children, when Josh was up here, our, our oldest, before he was 15 minutes old, he was in my arms, and I was quoting Scripture to him and assuring him of the love of God. And my kids have had the Word of God read to them and quoted to them all their lives. I don't care how much money my kids make. I do care. Go to one of those city pictures, Don, or somebody. I do care that they're there. That's big. I don't care if my kid's best kicker for the best pro football team wouldn't watch the game anyway until they like the national anthem, the flag. I'm not watching any of it. That's just me. I, it's all right to be a Christian and an American. You can be a Christian and a communist, too, if you want. But you can't be a very good either one of them not to do both. I want to make sure my kids are there. That's what I want. Don't occupy yourself too much with things this world. Don't, don't let it, don't let, Colossians 3, 1 says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. You know, if your body's weak and sick, now you're going to get a new one anyway. Uh, cr crutches are a pain in the neck, wheelchairs are a pain in the neck, prosthetics are a pain in the neck, hearing aids are a pain in the ear. <laughs> but it's, look, God's got replacement versions for all of us. It's going to be okay. And lastly, age is not an issue, nor is your health. God wants you to be faithful. That's all. You say, man, I'm so old. Well, are you faithful old? God rewards the faithful. That's what's important to him. Now, number one, if you're not saved, you're going to miss the whole thing. Number two, if you're saved, let's live for it. All right, let's pray. Father, bless us, direct us. We're grateful, Lord, that we have a heaven, uh, a city, not just a blurry, cloudy harp and halo and winged angelic sort of a facade, but a real city with a real Savior, real work to do. We're thankful, Lord, that we have a Savior who died to give us eternal life and adopt us into the family so we could live in that city. And there's a whole lot of questions and not nearly enough time and even several hours to answer all the questions, but we are grateful that there's a happily ever after. And so I pray, Lord, you'd help your people today. Encourage the Christian to keep their eyes focused on the eternal. And if there's some here this morning who don't, don't know for sure they're saved, I pray you'd help them to get saved. Help them to realize this world is very, very short. It is not going to live long. This world is going to be gone before we know it. And we may go before the world, but it's all going to burn up one day. And there is a grave that will hold our bodies unless something unusual happens and the trumpet sounds and we'll be saved and caught away. But if there's someone here not saved, help them to, to, to face the reality of eternity and where they'll be, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me just for a moment.